our worship service here at the Fair Park Bible Fellowship. We are uh, grateful and delighted today that you could be a part of our worship service. We believe that God shows up when we assemble. Where two or three are gathered, he is in our midst. And because he's here, we celebrate him. We celebrate the presence of God and we are grateful and thankful that he is among us. The Bible says that he takes up residency inside of us when we confess Jesus as Lord. In fact, our only capacity to confess him is because he has transformed us through regeneration. And so we are delighted to have him here and you with us. Our expectation, our anticipation is to hear a word from God. And we believe as we hear from him, we get our marching orders on how to live for him. And living for him is required of us today because the best expression of the reality and the existence of God is in the people of God as they practice their faith. And so we pray that you would join us in our ambition to become practitioners of God's truth. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful and thankful this morning that you called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. You encourage us to walk not as unwise men, but as wise men, for the days are evil. Give us the discernment to recognize what is good versus what is evil, and that we will practice what we know, doing the word of God in our lives. Let today be a reaffirmation through your word of the expectations you have for us to be Christ-like in all that we do, say, or think. We ask this in the name that is above all of the names, the name of Jesus, our Redeemer, our Savior, and our Lord. And God's people said, Amen. If you would open your Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And let us pick up with our study on being born again, the Necessity for new birth in the conversion of believers. New birth. The necessity for the born again experience in conversion. Uh, in this passage of scripture, verses 1 through 10, we've encountered in this passage five times the phrase born again or born of water. Five times. And in the Greek, the word is anothea, or anothean, which means born from above. And it's a better translation to say born from above. But born again means that you and I need something to take place in our lives that will put us in fellowship with God. Born again. Born again literally means born from above. It's a new birth, and it's an act that takes place exclusively by God. To be born again is an action that is outside of our capacity or our participation in. You must be born again. Let's go over a couple of things I think that would help us to frame for us where we're going this morning. Notice in verse 1 it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. And a Pharisee was a, uh, a special sect of believers in the Mosaic Law. They were not of the Levitical priest line. They were not of the Aaronic priest line. But these were men who loved the Word of God, who loved to follow what Moses had to say. And they were fastidious about doing. I, I called it last week the... Uh, punctilious, which is another word for fatidious. Amen. You just expanded your vocabulary today. They were punctilious about keeping the Mosaic law to a fault. And they saw themselves as being better than others because they were about keeping the Mosaic law. And they believed that their performance would, would put them in favor with God. But you and I know through study of the word of God is not by works lest any man should boast. But it's an act of God. And so they were operating under a false pretext. 
It says that he was a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews. He was one of those who was a part of the ruling class. And this man came to Jesus by night. It's interesting that he comes by night. I would submit to you he comes by night because he is a Pharisee. And the Pharisees were against Christ. And because he was a Pharisee, if he would have been associated with Christ, it could have caused a disruption between his relationship and the others in the set. So he shows up at night. And he shows up at night because Jesus, in his uh, public display, demonstrated a capacity that was unique to him and not to them. While they were about the business of performing, Jesus was about the business of teaching and displaying a power that was affirming the authenticity of his ministry. He worked miracles. Remember last week we went back to chapter 2. Go back to chapter 2. And notice from verse 13 it says, And the Passover, chapter 2 verse 13, And the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated in the, uh, at the tables. They were in there selling stuff for the Passover. Meat, doves, things that they could sacrifice on the altar for God. They were selling things and much like the, the Catholics were doing back in the, in the earlier part of the Catholic uh, history. They would sell indulgences. They would sell prayer opportunity. They would sell privileges in order for them to be right with God. And this is the same kind of thing that's happening here. And he made a scourge of cord and drove them out of the temple with sheep, oxen, and he poured out coins on the money, uh, of the money changers and overturned their tables. Now it's interesting, this is happening in the temple. And I want, you to, I want you to know the Pharisees were there observing this. And they didn't make anything out of it. They didn't like it because it was disrupting their source of income. But they also, out of their appreciation and understanding of the Mosaic Law, recognized what they were doing was wrong. And so not only were they uh, punctilious about doing minutia, Minoring or majoring on the minors as opposed to majoring on the majors, they were hypocrites. They were hypocrites. Now I want you to know Nicodemus was there watching this as well. Look at verse 16. And those who were selling the doves said, take these things away. He said to them, Take these things away and stop making my father's house a place of business. I would submit to you that's still happening today. Now, I do believe that pastors have a right to take their work products and make it available. Tapes and books, stuff like that. But I think sometimes they go too far. They're selling everything. You know, they can sell, you know, this guy's selling water from their sink, calling it water from, from the River Jordan. So you can buy this and have some healing. I mean, it's a mess in the church in America particularly. He says, stop making my house a house of business. 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal for your house will continue uh, will consume me. And the Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? This is, this is the Pharisees. What, what, what sign? Do, what, why are you doing this? What gives you the right to do this? And Jesus said to them, What sign do you show us? Or the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us that gives you this authority? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise again. And then the Jews said, then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and will you rise, raise it up in three days? And he was speaking of the temple of his body. And so he was, was raised from the dead 
So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this. And they believed the scriptures and the words which Jesus has spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing what? Signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Don't miss this part. Don't miss this part. First of all, many were coming to believe him because of the signs that he was doing. He was working miracles in their sight. Nicodemus was there. He was there when he wrote, drove out the money changers. He was there probably one of the inquisitors who was questioning him about what gives you the authority to do this. He recognized something special about Christ. And so did many who were observing him at this time. But notice Jesus was not giving himself over to them because he recognized what was in them. He is omniscient. He knows all things. Now we go back to chapter 3. He comes to Jesus and says, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. He says, at the minimum, we know that you've come from God because you, you're doing some extraordinary teaching here. And someone teaching like you, like this, must be from God. Hear that. This is from the Pharisees. And this Pharisee says, we know, the Pharisees know, you have something going on here. And they were interested. And he was interested to know. And his willingness to come to Christ was because he began to uh, become aware of the fact that his performance may not be enough to get him in favor with God. I want you to hold on to that. That's why this man is showing up here. He's got a problem. And he's recognizing, I may not be in favor with God. With all this punctiliousness, I still got some issues. Notice. For no one can do these things, and the things he's talking about are the signs that you do unless God is with him. They did not acknowledge him as God, but they acknowledged him as an outstanding teacher. Right? From God. I want you to notice Jesus doesn't answer any questions that he asks. But listen to what Jesus says to him. Because he knows Nicodemus' mind, and he knows what's going on in Nicodemus' mind, he answers his need and not his want. And Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And this is an incredible conversation that takes place, men and women. I want you to pay attention to this conversation because the sovereign grace of God is evident here. The need of man becomes the articulation of the purpose of God in the person and personality of Christ. He answers what we need. He says here, you must be born again. This is the statement that answers the need of Nicodemus. Not only Nicodemus, but all who are separated from God because of Adam's sin. Now put your finger where you are and turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When you get to 15, I want you to notice verse 50. Now go with me, I already hear some pages flipping here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. I want you to see this. Paul is addressing the church at Corinth. Look what he says. Now I say this, brethren, this is to you and I, who are in the faith. 
He reminds us that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You see that? Cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does per perishable inherit imperishable. That statement is an emphatic representation of the dilemma of all who are separated from God. Because we are flesh and blood. He says it cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We know that when we became Christians, we became a new creation. Paul tells us that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, uh, chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed. What is old that is past? That flesh and blood nature that we have corrupted in Adam is no longer prominently prevailing in the life of the believer. Why? Because new things have come. What is new that has come? A transformed mind that brings to us a transformed lifestyle that is consistent with the mindset that comes to us out of the new birth. Out of the new birth. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 and 7, we said last week, reads like this. He saved us. Who saved us? God saved us. He saved us. And I didn't do it, and you didn't do it. He did it. Who saved us? He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds, performance. Nicodemus, it's not your fastidiousness that gets you into heaven, your performance. Your deeds do not qualify you. Because any deed that we do is processed through the flesh and blood nature, which is corrupt. And it's putrefied. So how could that be? Well, let me ask you a question. When you pour yourself an ice cold glass of milk, and it's there and you're ready to drink it, and you turn away and you put your carton back up in the refrigerator and you turn back and you see the old fly go bzzz, pop and land right in the middle of your milk. Will you just take him and throw him out and then drink the glass of milk? You wouldn't dare do that, would you? Because you don't know what that thing has been sitting on before he sat in your milk. You throw it away. It's no good. And I'm telling you, the human nature, flesh and blood, is no good. It cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Do you see that? He says, not by deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. You and I are the recipients of the mercy of God. God extending to us mercy. And bringing us out of the darkness of our lives into the light of his purpose. It's an act of God, men and women. It's an act of God. By the washing of the regeneration. I said, hold on to that word. Regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We are made heirs. And remember, made is past tense of make. And anything that is made is, uh, for us is happening external to us. It's not because we did it, but an external action took place that made us available for eternal life. God did that. This is what God is saying to Nicodemus. This is what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. You must be born again. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is in third, in the third person tense here, one 
is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He's speaking in third person, but he's speaking directly to Nicodemus. I want you to know Nicodemus is getting this. And Nicodemus responds in third person. He said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? That's a good question. A good question for someone like you and I, but not for Nicodemus. You see, Nicodemus was studied in the Mosaic Law. He knew the, five, the, pen, the Pentateuch. He probably memorizes huge portions of scriptures and he knew the word of God. Jesus knew that this man knew the word of God. Look what he says in verse 10. And Jesus answered and said to him, How are you the teacher of Israel, the teacher of Israel, and do not understand these things? How could that be? You who know the Mosaic law, you who understand God's methods and means, you don't know this? So it's an interesting thing. Nicodemus is trying to figure it out. Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, verse 5, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This is a fascinating conversation. Because at this point, you and I, as we hear this, it is a question. I th we think Nicodemus got a pretty good question. You know, but God is speaking to him of something spiritual. And it's a reflection of the movement of God in his relationship with Israel. With Israel. I want you to turn with me. We're going to stop here and do a, a sort of a Bible study on this issue of being born again by the water and the spirit. Let's look at the, the, the spirit first. Go to Ezekiel chapter, chapter uh, 36. And in order for you to get this, you've got to follow me. You've got to follow me. And you've got to follow me in the word. Go to Ezekiel chapter 36. When you get to 36, I want you to notice verse 24 and following 24 and following he says for I will take you from the nations this is God speaking I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the land and bring you into your own land and then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean this is this is Ezekiel speaking the mind of God he says I will clean you up by sprinkling water on you and I will clean you from all of your filthiness and from all your idols notice he will bring them into the land and clean them up when he's bringing them they're filthy filthy in sin unclean but he brings them in and cleans them up spiritually from all your filthiness and all of your idols. 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from you or from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What's happening here? is that there is a new birth that's taking place. Amen? He says, I'm going to give you a new spirit within you and remove that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. What are you saying? In your present condition, you are unacceptable. But I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to sprinkle you and wash away the filth and then I'm going to give you a new spirit and a new heart. This action, men and women, is an action of God. Not because they had value and worth, 
It's because God selected them. He tells them that over and over again. When I found you, you were nothing. There's nothing special about you. You are simply my choice and I choose to love you. Twenty-seven. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Nicodemus knew this. Nicodemus was not unaware of this. And Jesus says, you must be born again. He, it should have clicked in his head immediately. But it didn't. Because he was too busy trying to uh, strain a gnat. To walk in a way that he thought was pleasing. To perform. To make himself acceptable to God through the filth of his reality. Same idea. It's communicated in Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31 through 32. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 32. Notice when you get there. Behold. Days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by their hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they uh, uh, broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. A day is coming when I'm going to do a new covenant, a new thing with Israel to create a new work with them. A new work. Nicodemus knew this. He knew that they were separated from God. He knew that they had offended God. And that God had put them under a punitive consequence. Nicodemus knew this. He was not unaware of this. I'll go back to John. I mean, this man is struggling here with what God has to say. Because he's thinking he needs to perform. And don't you know there's many Christians like that today? To think if they can just perform right, live right, be holy, maybe God will accept them? No. I'm sorry, that's not the case. It's not the case. Truly, truly, I say to you, verse 5, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the heaven or into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh, stop. That which is born of the flesh. Hear that. Born of the flesh means born in Adam's sin. Born of the flesh. We've already talked about Genesis chapter 3. Go over there, or chapter 6. Go over there and look at it one more time with me. Genesis chapter 6. And see God's pronouncement on the condition of man. Verse 3 says, And then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever because he is also flesh. Underscore that word. He's flesh. It breaks the relationship. It terminates what Adam and Eve had with God. It breaks the relationship. My spirit shall not strive with man forever because he is flesh. And nevertheless... His days shall be 120 years. Notice also Genesis chapter 8 on the other side of the flood. Now that's God's view of man on the front side of the flood. They're all sinners and their thoughts are evil continually. We see that in verse uh, 6. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on earth and he was grieved in his heart. And then the Lord said in verse 7, chapter 6, And then the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I created from the face of the land, for man and animal, to creeping things, and to birds of the sky. For I am sorry that I made them, because his mind is evil continually. That's God's assessment. 
Now, if you go to Genesis chapter 8, on the back side of the flood, God is saying something that's real similar. When you go to 8, notice verse 20. And then Noah built an ark or an altar to the Lord. And the only way, reason why he built the altar is because he knew he was a sinner. And he was coming before God to, to get his, his sins right with God. And he took every clean animal of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar. Now, last week I said that you've got to keep in mind that although he was taking clean animals, it seems like if he was taking them, if he, they went two by two, he's taking one half of all the clean animals. But he didn't, that, that's not true. How many of you know the clean animals went in seven by seven, right? And the unclean went two by two. So you had plenty of clean animals to make the sacrifice without annihilating the possibility of remultiplying uh, uh, the earth, replenishing the earth. Let's go on. Notice verse 21. And the Lord smelt the, smoothing, the soothing aroma. And the Lord said to him, said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. But I want you to pay attention to God's pronouncement about the condition of men. See that? That's what we call theologically total depravity. Men are totally depraved from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. The intent of his heart is evil continually. That's how God found you. And so when the Bible says that it's not by works lest any man should boast because our works are tainted with our evil condition. And so Jesus says unless he is born again, born again because that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That is born of the flesh. Flesh can't do it. Go to Romans chapter 8. Flesh can't do it men and women. Notice what the apostle says about flesh. Romans chapter 8. And notice verse 6. Verse 5 uh, through 6. It says this. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of what? The flesh. Those who are according to the flesh operate out of a mentality that is influenced by the flesh. By the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. It's death. Anything dead has nothing alive within it. It's dead. And any appeal to the flesh is an appeal to death. This is what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the flesh is dead. Notice that. It's dead. It's dead. It has no life whatsoever. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh, verse 7, is hostile towards God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. Notice this. Look at it. For it is not even able to do so. I want you to hear that's a hard word. For all of our semi-Pelagianists who believe that there's something good in us. And God appeals to the goodness in us to give us an opportunity to receive his offer of salvation. That's not what Paul is saying here. It says it doesn't have the capacity to answer the things of God. It doesn't respond to the things of God because its inclinations is towards evil. And it's dead to the voice of God. 
And if God doesn't quicken in us the capacity to hear him, we won't hear him. And we don't want to hear him. Remember what the kids used to say several years ago? Speak to the hand because the face don't understand. In other words, I don't want to hear nothing you got to say. And that's how men treat God today. And how they have indoctrinated our children to treat God through the evolutionary lie or deception. They don't believe that God even exists. That we, we came into existence through a big bang. Talk about a fairy tale. Amen. So Jesus said to him, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. It's flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. I want you to notice something here. This born again experience. And how Jesus frames this, I want you to see this. How he frames it is that this is something that must take place. You will find, if you scrutinize this passage of Scripture, that it does not give a how to be born again. It doesn't give you take step one or step two. There's no instruction here on how to do it. You know why? Because there's nothing you can do to make it happen. It's something that happens to you and not through you. There's no instruction here because it's God who's doing it. You must be born again. And the born again action is from God. Do you see that, men and women? If you take a, pay attention to the text, you'll see that he never tells him what he must do. You just simply tell them, you can't enter in unless you're born again. Born of the spirit and of the water. Notice. There's something here that I, 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 I think that you need to see. If you would go to a series of scriptures that are in Job. And... and, and if you remember, Job was in this dilemma, and several of his friends show up. And his friends, on the surface, when you look at it, it seems like they're telling the truth about what they're saying. You know, it doesn't look like it's bad advice. It looks good. But what they leave out is the sovereignty of God. God who is able to do what he pleases in every circumstance. Go to Job chapter 15. And 14 through 16. In fact, don't go there. I'll do it very quickly. Because our time is running out. He says this in 14. What is man that he should be pure? This is Eliphaz. Eliphaz says this to Job. What is man that he should be pure? Or he who is born of a woman that he should be righteous? He makes a statement here saying that, that those who are born of a woman are not pure. Because they have been born or birthed into Adam's sin. Adam's sin. In 15 he says this. Same, same chapter, 15 and verse 15. Behold, he puts no trust in Holy One, in this, in his Holy One, into God. And the heavens are not pure in his sight. He doesn't look at God as pure and God as relevant. How much less one who is detestable and corrupt. Man who drinks iniquity like water. His natural inclination is to do wrong. Eliphaz is right here. He's right. And what he's saying to, to Job is you can't make any appeal to God based upon anything that you do that's right. Because you're born of a woman and you're just as corrupt as we are. Then Bilidad speaks, and then Bilidad speaks, he speaks in Job chapter 25 and verse 4. This is what he says. How then can a man be just with God? How can a man be just with God when he's born of a woman who is unclean and he's impure? We can't be just with God. He's right. And these things are recorded here for you and I to get a view of who we are apart from God. This is our condition. Totally depraved and in need 
of a new birth. Listen to what he says. How can a man be right with God? Or how can he be clean who was born of a woman? Born of a woman. How can he be clean? He can't. He can't. Men and women, the Bible teaches of our condition. And this is why Jesus approaches Nicodemus and says, Nicodemus, you can't get in. And you won't get in unless you're born again. And by the way, being born again is nothing you can do about being born again. Isn't it interesting he uses that as the metaphor, as the analogy? And he uses that as an analogy because you know why? You had nothing to do with your first birth. You did nothing to contribute to your first physical birth. And you will do nothing to contribute to your new birth in Christ. Hear me? There's nothing you can do. And that's why we say you were chosen before the foundations of the earth. God chose you, elected you. He selected you. He called you out of darkness and brought you into the marvelous light because of his great love with which he loved us. God did that. Your born again experience had nothing to do with you. You are simply the recipients of so great a salvation. And that's why John says, what manner of love is this? What kind of love is this? That God would love us so unclean and so worthy of the judgment. And by the way, we're already condemned if you're outside of Christ Jesus, already condemned. Condemnation is not coming. You're in condemnation. But he reaches into the darkness of our circumstances and lifts us out and brings us over into the family of God. That is the regeneration called being born again. God did that. God did it. Isaiah 64 and 6 says it this way. For all of us have become like one who is unclean. Underscore the word all. All of us. You don't escape that all. All of us are unclean. And when I say you don't escape it, you didn't escape it before you received Christ as a born again Bible believing Christian. That rested on you too. Somebody say amen. For all of us have become like one who is unclean and all of our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. And all of us wither like the leaf. And our iniquities like the wind take us away. Take us away. That's the condition of man. That's what he's saying to Nicodemus. Who is a Pharisee who is fatidious about being detailed and keeping the Mosaic law. And they were crazy about that. Absolutely. And then he's sitting there seeing all the miracles of Jesus and he came to recognize, I'm not meeting none of that. How can I be born again? And Jesus says to him, verse 7, look at this. Do not amaze or be amazed that I say to you, you must be born again. He said, don't be amazed at this. Don't be, you know, trying to figure this thing out. I've already said to you, it's a work of God. You know that because you know Ezekiel, you know Jeremiah, you know Isaiah. And you know what the Bible says about this work that God will do. But look at this. Do not amaze that I say that you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes or from where it is going. So is everyone who is born again of the Spirit. And what he's simply saying here, don't, don't get upset or, or become puzzled by the fact that you must be born again. He says, it's a work of God. Just like you'd have no control over the wind. Anybody in here control the wind and tell the wind when it can blow and when it cannot blow? That's what he's saying to him. You don't control that and there's nothing you can do about it. But born again experience is coming from me, not from you. You can't tell me that you can open up a book and say, three ways to control the wind each and every day. Step one, you don't even know where the wind comes from. 
And you don't even know where it is going. And that means you have nothing to do with it. This is a conversation, men and women, that frames for us an understanding of what the born-again experience is. And so when I represent to you, or Paul represents to us in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, the golden chain of salvation, it is a chain that represents what God is doing. For whom he foreknew, he predestined. Whom he predestined, he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. And all of that action is controlled by the pronoun he. It didn't have we did that. It said he did it. This is an overlooked scripture. People don't want to deal with that. They just can't believe that God is choosing some and not choosing others. But you and I went over scriptures, didn't we? That says God is in heaven and he does what he pleases. He's sovereign. He's in control. The condemnation already rests on those of us who are in Adam. But God lifts the condemnation out of those who have been subpoenaed, called, no longer condemned. God did that. And so what God is saying to Nicodemus here, you can't enter in Nicodemus with all of your keeping of the Mosaic law and all that doesn't mean a thing. Because you're unclean, you're filthy. And unless you're born again, cleaned up, you can't enter in. This is a message people aren't giving to people today. And people believe that, well, if I, you know, bow my head and say three prayers each day, then I'll be saved. No, no, no. Salvation comes through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit who enters in and gives you the capacity to hear what you ordinarily would not hear if he didn't move. You heard the gospel because God made it possible for you to hear the gospel. And that's the reason why you're saved today. All the more reason why you and I ought to have a humble appreciation for what God has done. And you ought to be compelled to want to live for him because he rescued you out of the judgment that is to come. And there's a judgment coming unlike any other on the face of this earth. And so this conversation that takes place right here in the third chapter of the book of John is an important one to understand. You see, until you grow into the knowledge and understanding of what has been done, your actions will always be somewhat marginalized because you don't bring the full orb and understanding of what salvation is all about. Salvation is because God chose you. You were selected. Put your finger where you are and turn to John chapter 5. Chapter 5 and verse 21. And we'll close on this. John chapter 5, verse 21. For just as the Father raised the dead and gives them life, raised the dead and gives them life. Go back to Ephesians in your mind. Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And you walked according to the course of this world. But God being rich in his love for us made us alive. Just as the Father raised the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom He wishes. Do you see that? To whom He wishes. Doesn't that sound like that's a discriminatory selection? Doesn't it sound that way? And if it sounds that way to you, then it ought to impress upon you the significance of your sitting here today. 
You're sitting here today because God chose you. God chose you. He gives life to whom he wishes. You see that, John? All the way through scripture, the Bible makes that clear. It's my choice. I chose you. For my glory. That's why he did it, for his glory. That he might get the glory. From who? From you and I. And how do we give God glory? By making him our priority. God is not an ancillary consideration, secondary to all these other things that Jesus tells us about that will come into play in your life when you've got me as your priority. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And all these other things will line up the way they ought to line up. And I'm telling you, when God is not first, then things go wrong. And it may not come immediately, but I'm telling you, all it takes is just a slight move away from God here that will wind up as you move further and further away from your anchor who is God. And I'm telling you, you, you know that to be true. I don't need to tell you that. Either you're going to follow the line, if you get off just a little bit, it makes everything off. And I'm telling you, y'all don't seem to understand that. And that's why some of us are peripheral Christians. And I'm telling you, peripheral Christian has no power. Because the power of God is in the doing of the word of God. You cannot be peripheral. And this is not a ho-hum exercise. This is boot camp. Huh? You're learning how to operate within the family of God. And so you ought to quicken your attention and pay attention to what God is saying. What God is saying, not what Pastor Broton is saying, because I'm not saying it. This is God. I'll end with this illustration. Uh, when you go to boot camp, they teach you how to be a soldier. And one of the lessons that you learn as a soldier is how to operate your weapon. What they do with that weapon is they make them take it apart, put it back together. They show them how to load it and unload it. How to put it in a rest position and safety for others. How to operate it with safety with others. Then they teach you how to shoot the machine, the, the weapon. How to shoot it. Now when all that is going on and you miss one of the classes. And let's say you miss the one on how to load it. And they said today we're going to the shooting range. All of you grab your equipment and your gun and let's go. And you said, well, wait a minute, I, I hadn't learned, let's go. You just got to go because the sergeant said go. You got to pick up your stuff and go. And you get to the shooting ring and everybody's loading up and shooting and there you are trying to figure out what to do. There's too many Christians like that right now. You don't have enough of the knowledge of the word of God to know what to do when trouble comes. When the Bible says, Lean not to your own understanding, but acknowledge me in all your ways, and I will direct your path. You're trying to direct it for yourself. And I'm going to tell you, every time you look up without God, there's another problem that comes up. And the problem that comes up is instituted or engineered by God to get you to see that you need Him. Holes in your pocket. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I can't stop. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, it says that it was I who led you into the wilderness to test you to see if you would obey what I would say. To let you know that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It was I who put you in the wilderness. And God will put us in the wilderness in order to, for us to get to a place of recognizing we need you, God. Some of us, you are entering into some wilderness circumstances right now. Because you've been operating as if you didn't need God. Or you didn't express your appreciation for what God has done for you. And there's nothing that is more disturbing to have a child that is unappreciative for what you've done for them. You've raised them. 
change the dirty diapers, clean them up, send them on their way. And they have no respect for their mother and father. Have you seen that? I've seen it. That's how we are with God when he birthed us into the new life, giving us power, our faculty of mind. Some of us are in here pretty smart people, intelligent, but with certain capacities. Let me tell you, I know some of you in here, and you are smart people. You are intelligent people. God did that for you. Some of us got numbers. We can work numbers like nobody else can work. Trigonometry, algebra. Don't put that stuff in front of me. Can't handle it. Some of us got the gift of gab and we can go out and sell a, 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 a refrigerator uh, uh, to a, an Eskimo. We just have the ability to do that. We got some gifts and some of us are just administratively gifted and competent. We got gifts. God gave you those gifts. The job you have. Hello? When you didn't have it, remember you pray, oh God, give me a job, please give me a job. Just got out of college, got out of school, oh God, I need a job. And God opened the door for you and gave you a job. And you have been whining and complaining about the job ever since. Huh? It was God that did that for you. And your appreciation for what God has done for you ought to express itself in being in church on Sunday. Because he said, forsake not the assembly of the brethren. Don't make me a second place in your life. I'm not second. How dare you make me second? Do you know who I am? And so I'll lead you into the wilderness to remind you that you need me. And let me tell you, every time I've shown up in the wilderness... You know what my prayer is? Lord, whatever the lesson you're trying to teach me while I'm in here, help me learn it so I can get out of this mess. Don't complain about the wilderness. Ask him to help you to learn whatever you're, he's attempting to get you to learn. I just wish some of you in here would understand that. Instead of whining about the wilderness, upset because you've got trials, pray. What are you showing me? How can I learn from this? Have I been disrespectful? Forgive me. You know what David says? Cast not thy spirit away from me. Renew in me a right spirit, Lord. When he got caught in his mess, and he got some mess, and if God can forgive David, he can forgive anybody. Why does he call David a man after my own heart? Anybody try to figure that out yet? Because every time he discovered he was wrong, he was before God saying, forgive me, Lord. I need you. You see, but when you come to know that you need God, you become real nervous when you're on the other side of where he is. I will stop. Let's pray. Father, uh, you've said a lot today. Nicodemus had a need. His need was to be born again, starting all over. Flesh cannot produce anything but flesh. Flesh represents the fallen, corrupt humanness as a result of Adam's sin. And we're di disconnect, distorted in our thinking, distracted by the world, and we've lost our connection with you. As a nation, and for some of us, individually. We ask that you forgive us for that. Help us to realize the new life in Christ Jesus means that we are a new creation. Born again. Refreshed. Renewed. No longer operating in the old nature but in the new nature that is found only in Christ Jesus. There are no steps involved, no how-tos on being born again. It's an act from God. You did it, and we're grateful. In Jesus' name, amen.
We thank you for joining us today and being a part of our worship service here at the Fair Park Bible Fellowship. We ask that you would consider the message today. That the born again experience is an action that God has taken to rescue you from the judgment that is to come. There is a judgment coming. And it will come at the second advent of Jesus. The time for salvation is now. Right now. I trust that you would hear the gospel message. You must be born again. Born of the spirit and born of the water. The washing of the word of God that cleanses us and gives to us a new nature in Christ Jesus. I trust that you will consider that word and consider where you are in relation to that message in Jesus' name. Join us again next week right here, same time, on this same page. Amen.